so many people had such great value that they could add, but they never did, and they took it to their grave. And now there it is, in the graveyard, for everyone to see that little dash between the two lines, your date of birth and your date of death. That little dash is all we have. And unless we are deliberate about discovering who we are, there is absolutely no way I can know what is the best way I can contribute to the world in that little dash that I have. How would you rate your overall well-being on a scale of 1 to 10? Overall well-being, um, I'd say about an 8. And could you elaborate on why yeah, that number yeah, is so sure. high? So um, I'm an eternal optimist. So I always try and see the silver lining around the dark clouds. Um, in fact, last night I was just having a discussion with someone and the topic was around trauma. And uh, my view around trauma was that it's actually good. It's not bad. Of course, there's different versions of trauma. There can be extended trauma and severe trauma, which, of course, doesn't fall in the same category. But for me, trauma is, uh, is an inspiration. You know, so they say, uh, give an author pain you know, and, and he'll write about it. So, so for me, trauma, um, hardship, all of those uh, elements that other people might feel bring you down is a catalyst to do more. Um, so even, even the things that perhaps are tra quite traumatic, uh, for me, it's just an inspiration to plunge extra effort into things. Um, and so what typically would deduct from certain people's wellness in, 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 in entirety, for me, is an, a motivation. Um, so I suppose it's a very peculiar and unique way of look, looking at life. Uh, business is booming, so there's that, uh, which is great. Uh, we have more than doubled 100% uh, year-on-year growth. Our revenue, more than 44% 40, 40, uh, growth in gross margin. So from business perspective, great. Fitness as well. Uh, doing the park run in under 20 minutes is my target for the quarter. I still have a way to go. And then, of course, there's life. You know, So I have a uh, I'm, I'm father of uh, three kids, uh, husband, um, yeah, and no, I just try to maintain a balanced life. I think that's really important. If you want to feel well, if you want to be positive about life, you have to have balance. You can't just work. You can't just play. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, I'm in a happy place. So you mentioned trauma, mm -hmm. and this is something that fascinates me, so I'm going to dig a bit deeper. Sure. The first seven years of our life is the most pivotal mm -hmm. because that's where we essentially are sponges. Yeah. And there's a bunch of research that shows how pivotal those early years are. What stories were you told in those early years? Mm. And what was your childhood like? Yeah. So that's an interesting question. So <clears throat> I haven't spoken about this for a while. I grew up on a farm in the Northwest province. Um, it was tough. My dad had to have three different jobs. Um, so we had a dairy. Um, we we planted um, maize or mealies. mealies. And, uh, and he also did some um, speculation uh, diamond mining um, because neither, well, none of the three solutions really brought in enough money to sustain a family. So we've, we were four siblings. Um, he was the oldest child. And strangely enough, in our culture at the time, the oldest child got nothing from his father. So my grandfather gave nothing to my father. He had to buy everything to set a, a, an example to the other children. The other children each got a farm, got a car, etc., etc. My dad had just just had to make it work. So we grew up quite, um, I won't say poor by global standards, but by within the culture that we grew up in, um, we didn't have superfluous amounts of any, anything. I, I had one pair of shoes, uh, and that was the only pair. You know, I had to run in them. I had to go to church in them. Fortunately, we could go to school barefoot. So there was that. Um, I didn't have a uh, cold drink like the other kids at school. Uh, we had water with food colorant in it so that it looks like cold drink. Um, so that at least we could feel part of the crowd. But I mean, we, we all knew that we were drinking water. That, was, uh, that wasn't even flavored. It was just colored. So um, at the early stages, I mean, we, we knew that we had to go through those uh, trials, I suppose, uh, through a little bit of trauma. But it's also what creates character. I mean, I remember if we wanted pocket money, we had to do what the laborers on the farm had to do. 
So if we wanted pocket money, we would get home from school, we would pick up a pick and go and um, along with the other farm workers, we would go and uh, chop out the weeds from the from the uh, from the field. Um, so we grew up poor by standards um, in the community at the time, and uh, you know, so there was a lot of trauma, I suppose. There was a lot of conflict because it was where is the money coming from at the end of the month, um, and as a consequence, you grow up and you you get a little bit of grit and resilience, right? Um, uh, things are hard, you feel the tension in the house, you have to decide what you do with this, right? Um, so you, it, it, you, can, you can allow it to get into you. And I talk a lot about this. Uh, I watched a, um, a, a TED talk equivalent, a, a short meme once, and it was around the person that dove into a pool and how they said that as long as the water is outside you, you're okay. You're still in the tumultuous waters, you know, if it's like a sea or whatever the, uh, the case might be. You're still in these waters and there's still danger. But as long as the water is outside you, you're okay. It's the, if the water gets inside that you have a problem. The same with trauma, the same with the conflict that we see in the world. If it's outside you, you're okay. If you let it get inside you and it starts hardening your heart and it starts um, taking away the potential that you have, uh, that's when you need to deal with it so that it doesn't go inside you. So as long as you can look at it, almost distance yourself from the situation and say, how do I deal with this? How do I view it from the outside in? Um, and you can, you can use it to spur you forward rather than keep you back. Um, I think that that's a unique skill that you need how to How did you develop the mindset to deal with all these challenges as opposed to just become a victim and blame your environment and your circumstance? So I had the pleasure of, or rather the, the fortune of being able to go to the Drakensberg Boys Choir School at a very young age. Um, so I was actually in a hostel from age nine, which I always wore like a badge until I learned that my wife was in a hostel from the age seven. Uh, <laughs> she grew up in Namibia. And so there, of course, you, you have no option because everything is so far from each other. And one of the things that I will always remember, there's, there's two things I wanna just highlight. Um, I mean, the, the one benefit of the school at the time was you only get to see your parents eight times a year. Uh, the food for school holidays and then one weekend over the, in the middle of the quarter, which they call a parent weekend. So then the, the parents had to drive, I think, 700 kilometers in our case, uh, come there for a weekend, spend some time and then head back. Right. So, so you don't get to see your folks a lot. So you, you almost have to learn to be very self-sufficient from a very young age. What was really valuable was that the teachers reinforced, um, perhaps sometimes too much, you know, uh, the positive narrative to say that you are better than your circumstances. Um, there was a gent who was quite mainstream at the time, a motivational speaker called Miles Monroe. Uh, might have been before your time. <laughs> Maybe. And before many of the listeners' time. But he, he was quite outspoken about potential. Um, he told the story of when he went to school and um, they called him a stupid ape, you know, because he couldn't do math or some or other topic, I forget, it's many years back. And, um, and then at later, later in his life, he got his PhD and he went back to that teacher and said, I want to thank you because you called me a stupid ape and you said, I don't deserve to be in school. And that motivated me to prove you wrong. Now, a lot of the times, if you hear the message too, too much, it, you run the risk of it becoming a voice inside your head that you start believing. That, that's a risk. So you do need to surround yourself with people, part one to the answer. You need to surround yourself with people who do actually give positive feedback into your life, who tell you that no matter the circumstances, you are valued, you are loved, you are enough. I don't think we hear that enough. I don't think as parents we say that enough to our kids or to our employees, come to think of it. Um, the second point, which I think is really valuable, is at the, at the school, because there's 120-odd uh, kids in the school and choir is a big part of it, um, you know, you, you learn a new song. And what's peculiar is you see hands going up the whole time in, in practice. Um, and what the hand says is, I made a mistake and I know it. So we can continue. We don't have to stop. Because if someone made a mistake that's not harmonious and they didn't know it, now you have to stop. Now you have to start looking one child at a time until you find who made the mistake. 
So you learn at a very young age to say, it is okay to make a mistake. Put up your hand. It's not an embarrassment. We're all making mistakes here. It's a safe place. Put up your hand. We know that you made a mistake. You know that you made a mistake. You will fix it over time. Now we know this, so we can just go on. And it saves a lot of time and a lot of pain of going one child at a time, singing a phrase over and over to identify the problem. So I think the two parts to the answer to just summarize Surround yourself in spite of the trauma with people who give you positive feedback into your life to reaffirm not your circumstances, but your character, your potential, the fact that you're valued, loved, and appreciated. And the second thing, don't shy away from mistakes. Mistakes, we're all going to make them. In fact, if you're not making a mistake, I think you're not living your full potential. I almost a couple of years back set uh, myself a standard to deliberately make a mistake a day. I have to try and do something wrong so that tomorrow I can do it better. And um, the value of a heartfelt apology, when you do something wrong and you can go to someone and say, listen, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. It actually builds relationship and builds character. So um, I don't think we should steer away from mistakes. And that positive reinforcement, even if it's just one voice, is really important. What you're also speaking about is taking responsibility. Mm -hmm which I feel, in my opinion, too many individuals happen to be entitled and always mm -hmm. blaming and looking at the outside. So is there a framework that you would assess whether, or how do you actually take responsibility? Mm. Responsibility is interesting. Um, as the CEO of an IT company, uh, you know, many years back, when I was very young and still at university studying, um, I suppose like everyone, you think, I want to be the CEO one day. You know, you have this uh, completely naive view of what it means to be the CEO. Um, you look at it from the outside and you see the person driving the fancy car, wearing the suit, but it's completely not what it is in, in reality. Right? Tell us what it's like. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a view of what it's really like. Um, and then you start working for another CEO, right? And, uh, and you, you tend to, um, from time to time, become, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Judgmental, I suppose. It's very quick to stand on the side. I talk about the red pen mentality, to just sit and mark up the work of others. You know, it's very easy to sit on the sidelines and shout at the Springboks when they, uh, when they make a forward pass, you know, or to shout at the ref and tell the ref, how could he have missed that when you had the pleasure of 10 reviews, you know, 10 showing the same thing over and over from 10 different angles. He had one time in real time to make a call. So it's very easy to sit on the sidelines and judge. And it's really when you're walking a mile in those shoes, when you move from sympathy to empathy, and, and really you're the one being judged, that you realize what those people had to deal with. And I think once you get to a point where you're actually doing it, uh, where you're the CEO, and you realize what it is that you're actually having to deal with, um, you take on a completely different perspective and you become empathic walking in the shoes of the CEO rather than uh, standing on the outside and just judging. That's a really good point uh, just to pick up on developing that empathy because yes. you actually get to see what it's like in that in the person's shoes. Fast forwarding a bit, you worked for T-Systems for 17 years. Could you expand on some lessons learned in that environment in the corporate world? Absolutely. So um, I'm going to start just before T-Systems. So again, I come from a culture where it was accepted that if your dad banked with Absa Bank, you will bank with Absa Bank. And there were certain things that was just expected of you. So before I joined T-Systems, I actually ran my first own company, uh, which focused on bespoke development, uh, training the elderly in computer literacy, um, building PCs. In fact, the Northwest University was at a point my biggest customer. And um, I went from my last personal check was about 70,000 Rand for the month of running my own one man show, um, leaving that, selling that to a friend of mine at the time for 5,000 Rand, <laughs> uh, just so that there would be some level of uh, accountability to take the business further. It lasted all of three months and then it died. And then I joined an organization where my annual check was less than what I earned <laughs> in a month before joining the company. But nevertheless, that is what was expected. It was the logical uh, order of events. So I joined a corporate, worked for someone else. I had about 10 different roles during my journey at T-Systems over the 17 years. 
in the last 10 or so years was dedicated to sales, of which the last seven years was dedicated to healthcare um, as an industry vertical that we focused on at the time. Working for a large corporate, there's so much to be learned. Um, one is there will always be politics. And I'm saying this, I'm just giving them in no specific order of preference. Um, you can't distance yourself from the politics. Where you can, of course, don't get involved, but um, you're part of a system, right? And uh, people, people sometimes judge the church or judge a, uh, an organization based on an experience. But what is an organization? And this was the founder of one of the, or, or not the founder, but one of the CEOs at the time of IBM. He said, what is an organization other than a group of people working towards a common cause? But the company is really just a group of individuals, right, that, that are working towards a single mission, a single vision. So you are going to have people in the organization that you get along with, people that you don't. Ironically, um, today, many of the people that I reported to when I worked at T-Systems now report to me. So, and sometimes they were part of that political, and I use the word political loosely, but cultural environment within the organization that um, you didn't necessarily like, but you had to find a way to work with the people, even though the larger picture was perhaps obscure or, or um, not quite clear to you, right? Um, today, many of those people work for us and are doing brilliant work, and we have excellent relationships, in spite of the fact that at the time, some 17 years back, it wasn't necessarily the case. Um, some organizations are very bureaucratic, where you don't have access to certain higher level individuals within the organization. Um, and there are rules and governance and so forth. I was always a, a rebel, like you cannot believe, but my whole life, I, I, I suppose I still am in many ways. But now I have completely different KPIs that I'm measured against. At the time, um, at working at T-Systems, you know, big organization, uh, a lot of governance is required. The bigger the organization, more governance is required. And I always found that it was troublesome when I tried to run what I do in an entrepreneurial manner within an organization that wasn't entrepreneurial. And so one has to comply with the rules from a governance perspective. They're there for a reason, right? So whether that was easy or not. Um, one of the biggest challenges, I suppose, or learnings rather, um, was respecting people for the fact that everyone had different KPIs. And it's something that I think pulls through into the entrepreneurial world as well. Um, we will do those things against which we're measured. So in the book, as an example, I, I comment on the fact that um, everyone has an agenda. An agenda isn't necessarily something bad. But if I get measured based on revenue, and that is what my commission is based on, I am going to drive revenue, whatever it takes. Um, and yet I read something the other day, there's, a, uh, there's room for both optimists and pessimists in the world. The optimist designs the aeroplane, the pessimist designs the parachute. <laughs> so, so we have to learn to work with a myriad of people and understanding that every one of those people bring their own culture, their own background, their own framework of reference, and also their own KPIs. So when you started Converge Solutions, it was during COVID. It was just before COVID. Just before yeah. COVID. How difficult was that? And how did you mitigate the challenges mm. to actually survive and make it through? Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, so obviously, when we started the company, we didn't foresee COVID. <laughs> I think no one could. Um, so we founded the organization in December 2017, but only really started trading officially in mid-2018. So we had a little bit of a breather before COVID kicked in. Um, what's true, what was true then and what is true now is every year, uh, me and the two co-founders look back, um, just sort of a year in review, and every year our finding is how naive were we a year back, right? When, and, and when we started the organization, I don't think we truly understood what it was, the grandness of what we were embarking on and how difficult it was going to be. Um, it was 10 times more difficult and continues to be 10 times more difficult than what we could ever have imagined. But the same is also true for the flip side. It's also 10 times more rewarding, right? Because now we're following a vision and a why that we believe in. It's not someone else's vision. It's not someone else's strategy. Um, and I'm sure we'll look back to the why at some point. Uh, COVID was challenging, very challenging. Uh, we went from uh, a particular revenue to two thirds less. 
uh, because our customers couldn't afford the services. They were looking inward. Um, uh, so as an example, we deliver services into the financial industry, into the healthcare industry. Now, all of those were viewed as essential service organizations, right? So we, we were certified we could continue delivering services. But the healthcare industry, as you can imagine, were not really interested in moving up the value chain. They were interested in ventilators. They just needed to keep people alive. So there was absolutely no opportunity for you during COVID to go and knock on the door of a hospital and say, I would like to talk to you about X, Y, and Z, and unless that conversation was PPEs or ventilators, or how can I make floors, more floor space available and just deal with this absolute chaos, right? Uh, the same with financial services. People were buying back policies, you know, because they lost their jobs during COVID. So, so the average household income was diminished or severely impacted. People were suffering severe trauma, and I think we're still seeing the aftermath of that now and for years to come. Um, it was a very traumatic and very strange time in the world, right? So what we decided early on, we called a meeting, and we said to the guys, fortunately, we're a very virtual organization. We don't have a physical office, even today, but it's by design. Uh, we have points of uh, delivery points of presence uh, globally and throughout the country, but we don't have physical offices uh, because either we need to be in front of our customers or by virtue of what it is that we do, we can do it from a home-based office, right? It also spreads the risk a little bit in terms of load shedding. You know, people can quickly go to another person's <laughs> house and continue working there if they really need to. We just in install inverters at all our employees' houses, which we have. So at the early stage of COVID, we had to make a call. Um, and we called all the employees and we said to them transparently, um, you know, our revenue has diminished by 66% because customers are not buying. Certain customers called force majeure and stopped the project. We had signed a 240 million project uh, three months before COVID hit. To this day, not a single cent of revenue has flown for that. The revenue will start flowing again in June, which is great. Well, I can't say again. The revenue will finally start flowing in June. Um, this is how many years later, uh, four years later, the revenue will start flowing. So that's going to be good. <laughs> um, and, and so a lot of that happened. We had, we, we've only ever lost one customer in seven years, uh, due to a misunderstanding, which we couldn't, uh, remedy apart from that hundred percent customer retention, excluding customers who were forced to stop their services during COVID. Yeah. Employees is something that you prioritize. Mm. I've read this on your book. I've seen this mm. on your website. What does that actually mean for you to mm. prioritize employees' well-being? Yeah, it's you're absolutely right. It is a priority for me. In fact, I'd go so far as to say employees over customers. Uh, it's a it's a debate that is an ongoing debate. I actually ran a poll a while back on LinkedIn and was surprised to see that I'm not singular in my <laughs> opinion that the customer is not always right. So my view is that we can have the greatest products with the greatest services, but the only real differentiator at the end of the day is the culture within the organization and the employees that form part of that culture. I can have the best product, but if I don't have employees that are committed to the, to the vision, uh, to the journey, I have nothing, right? Um, and those employees can get you more customers. Those employees get me more customers. And it's not just from direct sales. It's, um, I cannot tell you how many customers would write to me to say, what a pleasure is it to work with the employees of Converge? They're dedicated, they're timely, um, they're, they're just overall a pleasure to work with. So we handpick our employees. Uh, we don't just go to market and say, we want someone and the first person that sort of has the acumen we appoint. No. What do you look for? Passion. Um, I can teach skills. I mean, it's the IT space, so it's not overly complicated, well, at least from where I'm yeah. sitting. Um, but you can't teach someone to be passionate. And I don't even mean passionate in terms of their job. I mean passionate as a person. Um, that's not something that you can teach someone. That's something that happens in that first uh, couple of years in their life where they decide who it is that they want to be. And um, if they believe in something, you know, uh, bigger than just themselves, they'll have, they'll believe in the organization, they'll believe in the vision. They have to buy into what we're standing for and why we're doing what we're doing. And then work ethic, etc. will not be a problem. As an example, our HR policy around leave is that we have no leave policy. That's our official policy. 
as an employee in, the, in our organization, you get to take as much leave as you need when you need it. Now, you don't need to ask permission, okay? Because when you need it, if you feel you really need to take some time off, who am I to tell you no? Uh, for me, your wellness is important because the better you feel about your life, the more effort you're going to put into making sure that what you deliver is of a high quality and a good standard and the likes. So for me, it's really important to say that the maximum output is possible if the employees are at their happiest. And at the end of the day, um, my employee goes with me on the journey. My customer might. Right. And the customer is more likely to go on the journey with me as an organization if my employees deliver great services. Because that, that's the interface, right? They, in, they don't engage with the systems. They use the systems, but they engage with the employees. So in the pecking order, so to speak, employees first, then customers. I like it. Your book, yeah. Cheeselings, Winelings, and Lessons for Life. Mm. What made you decide on writing a book as your medium to share this knowledge? I've always loved writing. Um, I think for English specifically, my, my English is much better than my Afrikaans. Um, so I've always had an A all the way through and I always received 100% for all my essays just because I love expressing myself in words. Um, if only my spoken English was as good as my <laughs> written English. So um, I've always wanted to write and I've written a lot of books, fantasy books, psychological books, children's illustrated books, now business books. Um, and I just felt that, you know, it's not quite an autobiography, although there are elements of autobiography in it. Uh, there will probably be a formal autobiography in time to come. But I just felt that the entrepreneurial journey has been so interesting. Um, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs. I met with another one this morning um, for a cup of coffee. Uh, and what I've, what I've seen is that we're all going through similar challenges. You know, we all have to uh, ask ourselves, what are we doing? How are we doing it? Why are we doing it? Which is most important. And how do we navigate these, these murky waters, right? And there's a couple of things that I think is universally true. Um, and I specifically wrote the book, which, by the way, I've subsequently changed the name. I, uh, I now call it The Young Entrepreneur so that people know what they're buying into <laughs> when they procure the book. Because as much as I loved the word, the, the, the previous um, name of the book, uh, it's difficult to associate it with entrepreneurship and business, right? So yeah, it um, seemed like I was reading a wine book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you, you think you're reading about wine and cheese, and that's not quite the market. Um, so I changed it to the young entrepreneur. Um, and I just felt that it's a good medium if it's a, literally a two hour book. You can read it on a flight between Cape Town and Joburg. And it just gives you a couple of basic, it's not wall transforming lessons, it's basic stuff really. Um, and I initially based it on the concept of who moved my cheese. You might have read uh, that book or it might have been a previous generation <laughs> as well. But about 30 million copies of Who Moved My Cheese has sold. And it's a very basic book that just uh, communicates a couple of principles. And that's sort of what I wanted to achieve. I didn't want to go and write 12 lessons for life, right? I didn't want to go and write uh, seven habits of highly effective people. I wanted to give people a simple book that can be read in two hours maximum, that just communicates some of those lessons that I think are universally true for entrepreneurs. I've subsequently done the audiobook as well. It will be available by the end of the week on Spotify and everywhere else uh, for those people that want to listen it while commuting um, because they can't read. So what stood out for me was the balance between the individual and the craft mm. and how you were able to capture, firstly, it's the internal work that mm. needs to be done and then hmm. finding out what your craft is so for an entrepreneur that who wants to be an entrepreneur but maybe does not know where to start hmm. not even about the business but yeah. on themselves where should they start hmm. on themselves it's a very good question so so one of the themes that the book i think communicates quite uh, incessantly is the fact that there's no difference at least in my view between business and life uh, and that's why the original called it Lessons for Life as well, because as we are in business, so we are in life. Um, 
you can see it when you play golf with someone, right? If they're going to cheat on the golf course, they're going to cheat in business. <laughs> it's that simple. How you do something is how you do everything. It, it, exactly. Exactly that, yes. Um, and so for me, the very first thing is you need to determine whether you have the right character to be an entrepreneur. It is difficult. Uh, it's long hours. It's a lot of unknowns. Uh, you know, I think it was a meme by with Johnny Depp uh, that I saw a little while back that said, how can you tell me to act my age? I've never been as old as I am today. You know, obviously <laughs> it was joking. But, but the fact is we're all making it up as we go, right? Um, and, and people don't want to hear that. They want to hear you have this exact strategy and you've got so much experience. And we do. We do have a strategy. And yes, we do have experience that we can fall back on. But the world is different from day to day. Right now, there's wars going on. We've seen the advent of conversational AI, which has changed the world that we live in completely. Um, you know, we have very South African nuances with load shedding. We have an election year coming up. There's a lot of things that are constantly changing. And we need to be able to, as individuals first, and then as business people that follows on that, be able, be able to navigate these waters. So we are making it up. We're making it up on the back of experience and on the back of strategy, but we still have to just deal with the realities around us. So what I can say irrevocably is that the single biggest attribute that an entrepreneur needs is grit. I almost want to visualize it by saying, take the seals, um, put them crawling through muddy waters while it's raining and pouring and coming down and knowing that at the end of this, is a goal and no matter the, the 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 problems that are going to be thrown at you you have to really just stick to it um it, it means you have to have a really big belief in what you're doing and simon Sinek, i think you know he says a lot of things but the one thing that he has said that i believe to be very true is understand your why if you understand why you're doing something right everything else around you matters less right? The circumstances you can deal with, the how might look different from one person to the other, but the why is what really gets you there towards the end. And grit is the relentless pursuit of your goal. Relentless. That means come hell or high water, excuse the expression, there is no alternative. Uh, you know, one of the things we said early on as our first strategy in those very naive days was, we don't want a back door. We don't have an option A and an option B. Because the moment you have an option B, that's what occupies your mind. What if something goes wrong? Then I have to f have an another plan in place. No, just have one plan in place. Uh, it sounds a little bit naive as well. Um, and I'm not saying only have one plan, right? But in a simplistic way, decide what you want to do and just do it, you know? Um, guess have a plan, have a strategy but do it wholeheartedly. If you're gonna think around, uh, if you're not gonna be absolutely sure about why you're doing it, how I'm gonna be doing it, um, you're gonna do it half-heartedly and that comes across. Anything half-heartedly comes across. Again, I do a lot of time learning uh, deliberately online, formally or not deliberately, but formally or informally. So I watch a lot of TED Talks, uh, which I think is a valuable resource. The second point is you have to surround yourself with people who are as committed to the journey as you are. Um, that might be friends and family to start off with. Um, one of the things that we did is we appointed upward. So we appointed non-executive directors or got trusted advisors who had decades of experience in business who we could soundboard concepts off. Firstly, it was pitching to them the why. Why are we doing this, right? Getting them to buy in. And then for them to buy into the vision and then contribute their learnings to us over time. And with contribute, I mean, we can constantly, in fact, I'm having lunch with one of them after the, after the interview today, where what we're doing is just soundboarding certain concepts because we're young. We're a very young uh, management team, right? And many entrepreneurs are young. They're embarking on this new adventure, but they don't know how the world works. So having some of these veterans that can, uh, that can guide you and steer you. You may choose to listen to them or not, of course, um, but, but just having access to that is really important. And then um, I think the, the product itself or the service that you're gonna deliver is secondary. 
Um, you have to decide what moves you. For me, one of the reasons why we do, uh, why we deliver services into the healthcare industry, when I was 10 years old, uh, I was in a bus accident. Uh, two of the kids died, five of us were seriously injured. I was one of the five who were seriously injured. I stand corrected, but to my knowledge, I broke 17 bones. Um, I died, they had to uh, get me back to life with a defibrillator. Um, my left lung filled with blood, so I actually drowned as well. They punctured me in my lung to get the blood out. It was quite messy, right? Um, to say the least. Traumatic. Yeah, it was traumatic. Um, and, and by the way, one of my wishes for every person in the world, as strange as it sounds, is may every person in the world have a near-death experience. Uh, it sounds really weird, I know. But something about a near-death experience changes the way that you look at life. You wake up in the morning and you have a slightly different perspective on everything that you have. You become more grateful. Uh, you live more deliberately. Sometimes too deliberately because it's quite, it's quite taxing. You know, if, if everything you're doing is deliberate, uh, it's quite tiring, but it's also fulfilling. So nevertheless, uh, I was admitted to Joburg Gen, where I spent a good three months having to learn to walk again, going through all those motions. Um, at some point, I wanted to amputate my one leg. I'm very grateful that my parents said no. I went to, uh, on to do provincial sports for a whole lot of different sports. It would have been very traumatic had they amputated my leg. So, but there was an, a good element of trauma. But I developed a young appreciation of the great work that the healthcare workers did. And that was in a public health setting, right? We couldn't afford private health. So there I was in Joburg Gen, um, recuperated to near perfect health again, against all odds, right? And um, it just stuck with me. You know, I should have died. Well, I did die. Um, I'm glad I didn't stay dead. Uh, they were, wanted to amputate my leg. But the great work, a lot of prayer, a lot of support pulled us through. And, um, and at some point in life, you look back and you say, what were those pivotal moments that had such an impact on my life? You know, the trauma, the trauma that inspires us to do things. Do you think that individuals live a life that's unintentional because we don't really come to grips with or don't really face that life is actually short mm -hmm. and we do we're all going to die one day it's always oh that person died yeah and, oh absolutely um i think you know i see so many people and I, I tell my kids this the whole time live deliberately you know i meet so many people and you know a lot of people ask me where do you find the time to write a book because I wrote 14 books last year. This is one of them, you know. Where do you find the time? And the quick answer is I don't watch TV. Now I quote from a lot of movies. <laughs> but I don't watch TV unless it's something that I specifically want to watch. I will not ever just sit and flick through Netflix or Disney Plus or whatever and watch something just for the sake of watching it. No, I have one life. One life. And this near-death experience that I wish for every person to have helps you understand that life is in fact finite. And the moment we understand that, we say, you know what, I need to live the adventure, not watch other people's adventures. I tell my kids, don't, whatever money you make in life, don't buy things. Leave the expensive suit, the expensive car, no one needs it. There's no real value. I know the world measures success based on worldly things. I think that's wrong. I don't think that has anything to do with it. Go find life, search life, seek it actively. You know, seek and you will find. Go live the adventure. You want to see the Amazon? Go. Even if that means mustering the courage to have 300 Rand, that's probably not going to buy you the ticket. But whatever little money you have, live the adventure, live the dream, because we really only have this one moment. You know, a lot of people are quite satisfied to experience life from the comfort of their couch. Get up from your couch and go and live. You know, then you will discover your why. How can you be passionate about anything sitting on the couch flicking through Netflix? What you're also speaking to is knowing what you value. Because if you don't know what you value, then you're probably not going to go to the Amazon. Mm. But if you value travel and adventure, you probably are going to make a plan, save up, not spend on the expensive material things, and spend on experiences. Or you just become an entrepreneur and you make it big and you can do both. <laughs> <laughs> so a quote in your book is always be authentic. Yeah. 
So does this tie into individuals knowing themselves mm. in order to be authentic? Because we can't be authentic yeah. if we don't know who we are. Exactly. Uh, it's so important. Um, I forget who said it. And again, I'm quoting from someone else. Um, I think it was Aristotle who said, uh, when I was young, and I'm also going to mess up the quote, um, I wanted to change the world. Now I'm wiser and I want to change myself. Something along those lines. I must go and read up on the exact quote. But we can't change the world. We can't impact it until I fully understand who I am, firstly, what drives me, and then can I understand what unique value I can contribute to the world. My father had a saying all his life where he said, the richest place on earth is not Silicon Valley or wherever else. It's the graveyard, which is quite morbid, but... It's because so many people had such great value that they could add, but they never did. And they took it to their grave. And now there it is in the graveyard for everyone to see that little dash between the two lines, your date of birth and your date of death. That little dash is all we have. And unless we are deliberate about discovering who we are, there is absolutely no way I can know what is the best way I can contribute to the world in that little dash that I have. And so I must deliberately go and sit, you know, quietly, shut out all the noise from the world and go and find who am I, what drives me, what is really important to me. And then will I become the employee that doesn't just work for a check, the entrepreneur who will succeed no matter what, has the grit because they believe in who they are and what they can contribute to the world. You spoke about entitlement earlier. So I'm going to tell you a sad joke. Um, and unfortunately, many years back, it was believed that, you know, apart from the fact that gold is the primary export of South Africa, um, in the professional services space, it was also argued that our ethos as a country was in fact an export. No matter where you went in the world, if you said, I'm from South Africa, they gave you the job immediately because they knew that South Africans stood for something. We were ethical, we were hardworking, we were resilient, we had grit, right? And so anywhere in the world you went, South, being South African was viewed as an attribute that would get you the job immediately. Somewhere along the journey, in the last couple of decades, we lost that, right? Now gold is our primary export. Um, and the inverse has become true because as a society, I believe we have become entitled. And so the story goes that there was a beggar and every morning, this guy would drive on his way to work and give him 10 rand every day. So to make the long story short, the second year, he gave him 7 rand 50. And the beggar was contemplating this and saying, sure, you know, the cost of living is going up. Inflation is skyrocketing. And now you're giving me less, but I need to pay more to be able to sustain my life. But 7 rand 50 is okay. So I'll be quiet. Third year, 5 rand. And at some point, the beggar looks at this guy and he says, I'm sorry, it's not that I'm not grateful, right? But I really just want to understand this. You understand inflation, sure, right? So an educated beggar. Um, so every year you're giving me less. And the guy says, yes, um, we've never spoken about this, but I have four kids, each of them a year apart. And the first year that I started to give to you, I didn't have any kids at university. So every year I take two rand fifty from the payment that I make to you every day and contribute that towards my kids' education. And the beggar contemplates this for a moment and he says, so wait, if I'm getting you correctly, it means that you're educating your children at my expense. So it's a joke, but it's really not a joke. As an entrepreneur, I cannot be entitled. I must be humble, no matter what I do. Humility first. Uh, we are not there to deliver a service or to deliver a product, but to serve Okay? And that's a fundamental difference. If we serve as human beings each other, and if we don't have an ego, don't ever have an ego. Ego is the enemy of everything. Be humble. Deliver what you do. Be sure about who you are. Absolutely. But not arrogant. So if we're humble and authentic, that gets us everywhere. Thank you, Johan. This was very insightful. You're more and than welcome. Thank you for the impact that you're making. I also want to acknowledge you for your grit and perseverance to grow these businesses, to coach, to mentor other individuals. And 
essentially paid forward. So thank you for doing that. And I look forward to the many books that you have to write. Um, the series, could you just maybe tell us more yeah, information perfect. about that? Yeah, thank you. So, so The Young Entrepreneur is uh, one in a trilogy of three books. So the first one is sort of a fireplace discussion, a really easy to ingest, just lessons from one entrepreneur to the other. Um, the second book, which is already available as well, is called The Scaling Entrepreneur. So that's when you've now sold to all your friends and family. <laughs> And now you want to scale into other regions. So it's basically an overview of commercial law for the average person. What you need to know to just get your seat at the table. Book three is not finished yet. Um, busy authoring that right now. And that's the leading entrepreneur, which is really around strategy and leadership. 